If the iconic structure in the background is the Church of St. George, then my community has finally entered the parish that bears the church's name. This is your weekly program that has always been concerned with the virtual gathering. That is, the gathering that occurs on air and online. I'm Sherwood McCaskey, as always. Thanks for your time. This week, we begin our journey throughout this, the central parish that holds a unique position in Barbados. Its boundaries touch six different parishes. While during the next four weeks, we will have the residents of this parish share experiences of growing up in their various communities, we thought that because of the rich history and the fact that St. George was originally set to celebrate land in the month of June, we thought it important and appropriate that we begin by placing things in the true historical perspective. Who is perhaps the best individual to do that? Well, of course, a gentleman whose navel string is buried right here in St. George. Dr. Henderson Carter heads the History Department of the Cape Hill Campus of the University of the West Indies. He is a lecturer and has authored several books and other publications. Dr. Carter went ahead of us earlier. He, in a sense, has planted his feet on higher ground. He is standing by to lead the discussion. Dr. Carter. Welcome to St. George. A beautiful parish. As you can see from the backdrop, we are here at Gun Hill, 700 feet above sea level overlooking the St. George Valley. St. George was a parish that was carved out of St. Michael. St. Michael is considered to be the mother parish and St. George was carved out around 1640, 1641. Now, it is 10,975 acres, a thousand acres bigger than the mother parish which is St. Michael. Now, St. George is the third largest parish in Barbados. But it is not just simply a parish, it is what I consider the breadbasket of Barbados. It is the parish that fed Barbados from the 1630s right up to this present time, the breadbasket. And why do I consider St. George the breadbasket? Look at this view. This is not only a beautiful view that tourists come and enjoy, but this is the very fertile, deep soil St. George Valley. The soils are fertile here, very deep indeed. This area gets a lot of rainfall and not a lot of runoff because the, the rain fall runs off from the Christchurch Ridge in the distance and from this area into the valley and incidentally that also provides us with a lot of our groundwater resources so that in that valley you would find that there are most of our factories and our plantations were located and the reason for that location is because of the abundance of groundwater. So in terms of the breadbasket, therefore, we can see that this valley still produces a lot of sugarcane, still produces at certain estates like the valley and Brighton, a lot of ground provisions, yams, potatoes, edels. It is the breadbasket. But St. George is not only the St. George's Valley. There's a place on the other side of the the, the parish on the northern side of the parish called Sweet Vale or what the, 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 the people used to call Sweet Bottom but that name has gone out of existence these days but Sweet Vale is also a rich agricultural area the lands are very fertile in fact they have at Sweet Vale what we call the red soil district you look at the soils, you see that clay nature of the soils, and they're very fertile indeed. 
And again, that is a, a, a veil, a, a what we call a bottom or a valley, and they get a lot of rainfall in that area. But we also have the central uplands. The, the central uplands are made up of some of the biggest plantations in Barbados. For example, Draxall Plantation, over 700 acres in the 1680s. The Monk Plantation, again, another big uh, plantation. Cottage Plantation, Fairview Plantation. We are talking about some high rainfall areas and soils that are very rich. So when we look at its geography, therefore, we could understand why this this, this parish has been called the breadbasket of Barbados. And even on the marginal lands, what we would call the peasant lands, the peasant lands of Draxall, the peasant lands of Jordan, the peasant lands of Workman, the peasant lands of Applewitz, people have been growing produce especially cane. As a matter of fact, St. George is famous for its, its um, small farmers with trucks drawing cane. And there were a lot of them in this, in this area. We have Mr. Parrish from Freehill, uh, um, uh, uh, what we would call a, a small farmer. He had a truck and he used to draw cane. We have Sidney James from Newberry, he used to draw canes. So if you wanted your canes drawn, you go to Sidney James, he comes and you get some laborers from the village and you draw those canes. The point that I'm making here is that in the, the peasant economy, in the peasant economy of the 1960s, there were people who were producing canes and also producing a lot of vegetables. My father, who used to work at the factory at Buckley um, in St. George, also rented land. And he used to produce potatoes. He used to produce yams. And sometimes my mother, who was a housewife, would go into the ground, go into the, the, the field and farm. And at the end of the day, we are bringing home yams and potatoes and all sorts of produce in, 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 uh, in, in the home. That was the peasant economy. And it made up the, what we call the breadbasket of um, St. George. So we have, therefore, a very thriving economy. And even up to this day, even though the sugar industry has declined remarkably, even today we have plantations which are still providing us with our beans, our carrots, our tomatoes, our lettuce, all of these things we are still producing on certain plantations in the St. George Valley. Even peas. At Christmas, St. George, you can go to certain plantations and get your peas. And I had an experience a couple uh, months ago in Christmas 2019. I left home with my wife and we ventured out to the valley plantation. We heard that peas were picking and we got there about 6, 5.45 and there were hundreds of people in the field picking peas and making sure that peas were on people's tables. Peas were being sold all across the country. That's the point that I'm making St. George as the breadbasket of Barbados. There are other parishes, yes, that produce, but this is the parish. This is the parish with the soils. This is the parish with the land. This is the parish with the rainfall that helps us to achieve that distinction of breadbasket. You would note that Dr. Carter did say that other parishes produce as well, but the emphasis is on the rainfall and how it drained into the parish of St. George. These factors that facilitated the growth of agriculture.
Now, let us take a look at the early settlement pattern in the parish. The other point that I want to make refers to the settlement patterns of St. George. Even though it is predominantly an agricultural parish, the people have used what we call marginal lands to establish themselves in villages. As a matter of fact, in the early 1890s, many new villages were carved out of plantations. For example, Workman's carved out of a plantation, Newbury village over uh, to the east of where we are standing here, carved out of plantations and they became settlements. They became settlements. Rock Hall over uh, behind me, Retreat, my, my special village where I grew up in, or, or what we now call uh, Briggs Hill. Those settlements were carved out of small plantations. And the bigger settlements, there's Ellerton to the east. There is Charles Road Bridge down to the west. As a matter of fact, I refer to Charles Road Bridge and that what we call um, the Glebe area as the capital of St. George. That is where we find the historic St. George Parish Church. That is where we find the St. George Primary School, the old one and the new one, and the St. George Secondary School established in 1972. That is where we find our gas stations. That is where we find our supermarkets, our shops, our police station, and our library, and now our library resource center. So I would say that when, if I had to, to, to determine and to um, coin a capital of St. George, it would be Charles Road Bridge, that area uh, 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 to the west of us. So we have many settlement patterns growing up around Charles Road Bridge, and of course, just east of the bridge, we also have a cholera burial ground. Most country, most parishes rather, have cholera burial ground. And, and those burial grounds go back to 1854 when the cholera epidemic struck Barbados in May, June, July 1854. It killed 20,727 people. 20,000 people lost their lives in that uh, three month period. Could you imagine that? Be I, I believe it, is, it was even more disastrous than the COVID-19 epidemic on the, the human population of Barbados. It carried away nearly a third of the Barbadian population. And there is a cholera burial ground there uh, near the St. George Parish Church. And um, the folks there know where it is and nothing is growing in that area. That area is respected. Nobody wants to trouble the soil because there is still some fear that, um, you know, if you trouble the soil, you can get into trouble. So those are some of our villages. Those are some of the areas where people live um, in St. George. In next week's program, Marva Green of Carter's Bakery will detail life in Charles Road Bridge. Now, the program focuses on communities, but it is somewhat important that we take into consideration certain aspects of the parish's early history. How many of you have heard stories of the military outpost and its association with the Confederation riots? and of course, the role played by the residents of this parish in those riots. We are standing here on this tank, now covered, now cemented, of the command post of the military. That command post we now call the Gun Hill Signal Station, but it was really a command post built after the 1816 Bussa War. And it dates back to 1818. And right here, 
the military could not only transmit signals all over the island, but keep an eye on the laboring classes, especially those who wanted to protest and who wanted to riot. And in 1876, right here on this spot, during the Confederation Rebellion, persons who were captured rebels or so-called rebels who were captured were stored here until they were sent down to Bridgetown. So having captured the rebels, having had them locked up here, there was an attempt made to free them. So the, the, the workers, the, the, the rioters, the protesters, they armed themselves, hid in this cane field to my right, and then stormed this military outpost. Of course, they were repulsed by the firepower you can see here, cannon and guns and everything, and that attempt failed to uh, rescue their comrades. But St. George was the home, the epicenter of that 1876 Confederation Rebellion. It started at a plantation called Bide's Mill, or Bidey Mill, on the eastern part of the, of the parish. And the writers there, or the leaders there, were the Dutton brothers from Bide's Mill. But the overall revolt was planned and executed by two St. George people, a fellow called Green, Henry Green, who was about 27 years old, and another fellow called Colonel Smith Beard, who is incidentally from Workman's. And Smith Beard met his death at Applewitz while attacking Applewitz Plantation. So the parish, therefore, is steeped in history, especially the Confederation Rebellion. The breadfruit was first planted in the parish of St. Joseph. Do you know what St. George is known for? Constant plantation over to my left is also steeped in history. We talk about the sugar revolution and, and the movement of sugar from Brazil to Barbados and this explosion of sugar. But the first experiment the first canes that were brought from the Guyanas were planted there by Constant Sylvester at Constant Plantation. Now the experiment did not go too well and later Colonel James Rats grew canes as well at his Rats Hall Plantation and then another Colonel Haldip grew canes at Locust Hall Plantation. But the point that I'm making here is that Constant was the first place where canes were grown in Barbados. And Constant Sylvester also tried to use Dutch capital to create that plantation enterprise that would one day become a flourishing one. So here's uh, Sylvester using Dutch capital to enlarge and to develop his, his plantation. The name Drax is synonymous with St. George, but what is not widely known is its association with two schools, not in this parish, but two schools that were originally situated on what was known as Constitution Hill in the mother parish of St. George. Now, the history of St. George, of course, revolves around the Draxall plantation as well. Draxall was the largest plantation in the area, over 705 acres in 1680, and over 800 acres in 1914, always owned by the Drax, established by Colonel James Drax in the 1630s. And it was there that Drax built up his empire. And from the profits of that, that plantation, from the profits of sugar, he created a charitable trust. And out of that trust, 
a school was created at a place called Constitution Hill in St. Michael. That school was for poor white persons in the country and it's called the Central Boys and Girls School. And out of that school, we have two schools being created, the Commermere School and Queens College. Two schools coming out of that, that um, Drax Charitable Trust, going way back to the 1680s. And of course, I must add that Drax Hall Great House remains one of the oldest plantation great houses in Barbados, along of course with St. Nicholas Abbey, along of course with the Plantation Great House at Codrington. As we are speaking about the early history of this parish, mention must be made of this family who, because of their wealth, reportedly talk only to God and not their neighbors. We cannot look at the history of St. George without making reference to the piles of Brighton. We talk about the land empire of the piles. At one stage, the piles controlled plantations such as Carmichael, Buckley, Jordan, Brighton, Buttles. So the piles own a significant amount of land in the St. George's Valley, okay? And they own land and control land in other places. So the Pearls were a very significant uh, family in Barbados. And um, not only were they significant landowners, but we are talking about their control of the House of Assembly, their control of certain businesses in Bridgetown, very important family. As a matter of fact, one of the piles, a fellow called R.H. Pyle, took laborers to Tobago in the 1860s. Okay, there was a migration to Tobago in the 1860s and Pyle took laborers there. And that came to our notice because there was a rebellion on one of those plantations in 1876, May 1876, just a week after the Confederation Rebellion, there was a rebellion on one of Pearl's plantations in Tobago. Um, it is called the Banana Riot in Tobago, 1876. Many of us are familiar with the phrase, walks in a name as recorded in Shakespeare play, Romeo and Juliet. We have often been fascinated by the names of our communities and our buildings. Dr. Carter calls attention to one such in this parish. We have a lot of interesting place names. And one of them is a plantation behind me called Moonshine Hall. You can see it there down to the west, or Moonshine. But why is it called Moonshine? has nothing to do with alcohol, nothing to do with rum. It has to do with the process of building the plantation. In the 1680s, one Sir Robert Davers, who was Commodore of the Naval Station here in Barbados, got his men during the night, not the day, to haul lumber from Bridgetown, from Carlisle Bay, right up to the plantation. So he would do it during the night. He would do it when the sun is down and when nobody's around, nobody's looking. And he would haul the lumber, he would haul all the building materials to his plantation there. And that was called, why it was called moonshine because it was constructed on the, the bright moon. In summing up the early history of the parish, Dr. Carter uses the symbolism of the carved lion and he points out something to us that is often overlooked, but yet quite interesting. The, the history, therefore, of St. George is a very interesting one, one in which excites people 
and one in which brings people to the parish and brings tourists from all over the world to the site and of course the site on my left what we call the lion the lion is a very significant site i consider it as the most visible symbol of colonialism in barbados yes we talk about parliament and we talk about queen's college and all of these schools and the place names but this one at saint george in my view is the most important relic of colonialism but why do i say so in 1868 captain wilkinson and his band of soldiers encamp on this this terrace you see bush now but this was terrace decided to carve a lion out of a piece of rock one piece of rock and he carves a lion out of that piece of rock he carves this lion but he places one paw of the lion on a ball a red ball to signify Britain's control over the entire world or most aspects of the world. The lion is a British symbol. It's also a Rastafari symbol and there's a story about that. But to place that paw on various parts of the world was indicative of the fact that Britain once owned and controlled Australia, New Zealand, India, Canada, even the US, what we call the US. That was once a colony of Britain, 13 continental colonies before George Washington led them to independence in 1776. And colonies in the Eastern Caribbean as well. So Britain controlled most of the world. There was a saying that the sun never set on the British Empire. So here is that symbol of colonialism. The lion with his foot on a ball indicating control of the world. Around 1990 and 91, the Rastafarian community or a section of the Rastafarian community, I'm told, one morning, repainted the lion in their colors repainted that lion that white lion red gold and green and people woke up the next day to see a lion transform colonialism sort of smash of course you could not have that in barbados with a strong british heritage and the next day all efforts were on hand to repaint the lion in the original color white. So that's a little story on the lion. And so it came to pass in St. George. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Here's a special invitation for you to join us again next week at the same time as the people of this parish share their experiences of growing up in their communities. I'm Sherwood McCaskey, as always, thanks for your time. <laughs>